Hey everybody, Joe Pop from the Pop Rock Shop podcast, Popcast, and today we have Steve Botnick, hey. of drummer of Jacksonville fame. Am I pronouncing your name right? How Bocknick, is it? Yeah. Botnick. Botnick. Okay. Botnick, yeah. I know there's a K in there. There it's is. A, it's, it's a German a, thing, right? Yeah, so. it's a silent K. It's okay. A, sometimes it's not. Okay. It's one of those. It's one of those. It depends on where you are. So where were you? Where were you born, and what year? I was born, believe it or not, on the Robbins Air Force Base in Warner Robins, Georgia. Okay. Uh, January 1966. So you are my seventh guest. And I've yet to have a native, somebody born in born Jacksonville. Yeah. So, and you know, there's a lot of Navy <laughs> stuff and things like sure. that. So the, the closest I got was Darren Ronan was in Vegas for yeah. one week and right, then moved right. here. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, and what was your first instrument? Was it the drums? No, no, no. Um, I guess when I was about five, six, um, I started taking piano lessons and guitar lessons at the same time. And... Um, as you will, as we'll discover, mm -hmm. uh, I've had a very tumultuous relationship with the guitar, mm -hmm. like a like a girlfriend you break up with and mm -hmm. get back together and give it, until either the breakup sticks or the makeup sticks, one of the two. Mm -hmm. And thankfully for me, the uh, I stuck with it third time. Um, I was a theater kid. Oh wow! Yeah, I mean, I was first time I got on stage, I was hooked. Uh, my mom's dad was a magician. Wow! Yeah, and uh, <laughs> apart from also being the uh, clerk of the county court down in Lakeland, Florida. Okay. And um, I, first time I got on stage with him, I was, I was hooked. I'm like, you know, this is, I love being on stage. Love how how old were you? About five. Yeah, he and were me. you in Jacksonville then? Or no. In uh, yes, we were in Jacksonville. We moved here in 1970. So you were yeah. four, four, five? Yeah, okay. right up the street. And okay. um, lived there, grew up there my whole life. Wow. And, um, yeah, so I was, you know, I, it was weird. I was a theater kid, but I couldn't really sing very well, and I still can't sing very well. <laughs> and, um, and so, so that it was difficult. I, I had, I did all the other things. I took piano and guitar, and what happened is the guitar kind of fell to the wayside, and I stuck with the piano for another five or six years mm -hmm. um, until I wanted to learn how to play Elton John, and my <laughs> piano teacher said no. And I'm like, well, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do what he does. And, you know, again, the performance, the, you know, I, Elton John was, I saw him when I was like nine years old. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my God. And, um, and you were like, I want to do that. I want to do that. Yes, I want to do that. And what we do in like classical standard Yeah, you know, Greek stuff. concerto and A minor and blah, mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. And I wanted to learn how to play Little Richard. I wanted to learn how yeah. to play, you know, I wanted to learn how to play Fats <laughs> Domino, um, you know, and, and Elton John. And, um. Yeah, so I so like I say the as far as like not being you know everything's musical theater as far you know, mm -hmm. and um, what I had was a voice that I could do stuff with, but I just couldn't really sing. I could do accents, I could do impressions, mm -hmm. you know, I could I could I had something to offer, but as I got older in theater, that became more and more of a yeah we don't care can you sing you know mm -hmm. can you do this mm -hmm. and I'm like, eh, not really so. Um, and this was in school, like in yeah, high school yeah, or yeah. grammar school. Yep, yep, yep. I'll, I made it up uh, probably until um, the last God, last thing I did was like when I was a sophomore in high school. It was like okay. last, yeah. And then when did the drums come along? <laughs> drums came along uh, when I was about fourteen. When I yeah, um, again, I had dropped, I had stopped playing guitar, and I had picked it back up again. I had a wonderful teacher named Carl Hardwick. I don't know if you know Carl. No. Uh, great guitar player, great teacher. Um, I just never, I, it was, again, I didn't want to do the, I just, I would learn if, if I liked it, I would learn it, but I didn't want to learn the nuts and bolts, right. you know? And so, uh, this would be my second time with the guitar. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so what I did, and I grew up here, um, Music City, which oh, used yeah. to be right, yep, Butch and all those guys. Yep. And I had a PVT-60, which I wish I still had, uh, because apparently they're like, Kind of you know a hot item. People want to buy those now. They are now they yeah. are right, right. And back and, uh, then it was sort of like a. a and if you know yeah. the, the the sort of the idea of PV, they, he was very Hartley PV was very big on having stuff made in America. Right, right. But his stuff looked kind of like you got it at Home Depot or something. Right. Like the T sixty was this really heavy, it robust was, guitar, and they made a T forty bass. They did two cutaways, and it yep. was yeah, it was it was. A, the only person I ever saw play it professionally was Jerry Reed. Was the mm -hmm. only I think yep. because he, yep. you know, he was uh, I guess sponsored. Yeah, yeah probably yeah, from yeah. Mississippi, I right. would guess, or something like that. So, <laughs> but anyway, uh, so I went down there, 
And I traded, I had a T60, a little backstage amp, and I traded it for bottom of the line, very used Ludwig, a little five piece kit with a like coral or almost pink, like kitchen countertop linoleum finish, mm-hmm. one of those, you know? <laughs> and, um, and here's the thing that, 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 you know, I took lessons in piano, I took lessons in guitar. I have never taken a drum lesson in my life. Mm-hmm. And I literally got home with it, put it, put it together, and I, I kind of knew, you know, and I sat down and I could do it. Wow. F- five minutes later, I was playing a basic drum beat. And so for the next two or three years, I just put on headphones. I never had intended to be a drummer in a band. Mm-hmm. I just put on headphones and I played, you know, uh, I had Deep Purple, um, mm-hmm. The Who, The Beatles, yeah. ACDC, mm-hmm. um, you know, all this stuff. And then, interestingly enough, the Big Chill soundtrack. Really? Yes. <laughs> which served me so well later because there's so many different little beats and yeah. feels on that, you know, like, like Motown. Heard through the grapevine and all the Motown exactly. stuff. Yeah. You know, and learning how to play that, you know, Motown. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A lot of some, you know, it's, it's like, oh, thank God I can do it. Um, <laughs> and so that was it. That was it. About like when I was 14, starting high school. And um, Wow. And then yeah. what was your first band, like, of merit? Like, not, not uh, I mean, we all had our high school <laughs> bands, but what was the first time you played a gig? Uh, that you felt like this is this is my thing. Was the Blaine Cruz band? Oh, I saw you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that was Chris McFall on bass. Well, right? not a, not, a, not originally. I, no, originally, it was uh, David Barnett, who was a classmate of mine at Episcopal, mm-hmm. and um, Jerry Cornwell, a really good guitar player. And then um, I'm trying to remember who the original drummer was. A guy named Brooks, and a guy named Dan, and then me. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, so David, uh, yeah, uh, Dan stopped playing, and so David asked me, he knew I played drums, and like I said, I just kind of fell backwards, ass backwards into playing music. I, you know, I wasn't a punk guy. Um, I was into classic rock. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah, so I guess towards the t- summer of my, in between my junior and senior year was my first gig with them. And uh, so we did that for a year, David, and then David left, and he went to, uh, went to school up in Virginia. And that's when Chris McFall, who I met earlier that year. So I didn't know there was that heavy of a turnover in Blaine yeah, Cruz. Yeah. And who was the lead guy? Was his name? Always oh, Blaine, yeah. Blaine, Blaine yeah, yeah, But yeah, it yeah. wasn't, his Cruz wasn't his real name or what? That's his last name, yeah. yeah oh, okay. Yeah, Blaine Cruz, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I saw you guys at the Blighted area. It uh-huh. must have been, God, I can't even remember, 80, 85, 6, yeah, 84, something like 85, that? somewhere there. Yeah. yeah, and I was just like, I was just kind of getting into punk. Right. You know, and I forget, you guys did a cover of like Substitute or something. Or, <laughs> sure, yeah. uh, so I wonder if that was your Who influence or. Maybe. I, I, this, but, is, this is kind of embarrassing, but I, I was in that band for about a year, year and a half. And I asked Blaine, I said, Who wrote Pretty Vacant? I said, That's a pretty good song. Yeah. And <laughs> well, when I realized that all these songs we were doing were punk covers, yeah, yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. You yeah. Know, and um, Sex Pistols cover. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And you thought he was writing these songs? Absolutely, man. You know, who wrote I Want to Be Sedated? That's a really good song. Yeah. And, you know, and so, of course, uh, my education, Chris, was really kind of instrumental because mm-hmm. uh, Chris was in a more, in a more alternative. And at the time, I was sort of into like uh, Joe Jackson, Devo, Elvis Costello. You know, high mm-hmm. school. I yeah, had more sk- the new wave, skinny stuff tie, the, pointy yeah. shoes. You know, mm-hmm. I had that. And um, so yeah, so Blaine Cruz for uh, until like ni- until late 1986. Yeah, yeah. And then the filters were next. No, the then, filters uh, were. Then was Big Velvet Elvis. Well, when did the fi- the filters were before? No, filters came. Well, filters existed before. I joined them. Right, like way Correct. before, like right? Okay, eight, oh, all right. Yeah, right, right, right. Late okay. 70s, early 80s. Um, in fact, I auditioned for them. I was 17. Mm-hmm. So this would be 82, 83, something like that. I, I was too young, obviously, to play. Right, right. But I found out later that was like the second time the band had gotten oh, back yeah. together. Yeah, and Because um, I saw them before I graduated in high school, so that oh, was yeah? 82 or yeah. 81. yeah. And they were doing very new wavy type stuff, yeah. but you weren't in the band then. No, no, I joined in ninety. Oh, so yeah. okay. Yeah, so yeah, then yeah. it was so after Blaine Cruz, it was Big Velvet Elvis. Big Velvet Elvis, Elvis um, which is you know, the, I say this without hesitation. I we were Jacksonville's first alternative supergroup. 
Because mm-hmm. what happened is right within a few weeks of each other, Chris and I quit Blaine Cruz Band. Palmer Wood mm-hmm. left Horse Child Breakfast. That's when Scott right. Luthold came in, and, and yep. they became Beggar Weeds. And Tommy was out of the Switchblades. Right. And, you know, it was just one of those, you know, guitar player, guitar player, drummer, bass player, one of, you know, let, let's be a band. Mm-hmm. And um, so we did, yeah, and we got together, and, I, you know, we, we had uh, so many different influences. We all came from different, you know, backgrounds, and, you know, Tommy was into stuff I had never heard of. Palmer was kind of like more like me, kind of classic rock, Stones, whatnot. Mm-hmm. And Chris was into The Cure. Yeah. You know, and uh, Brian Ferry and stuff like that. And uh, so we, we just kind of threw it all together. So this is 85, 6? 87. 86, 87. 87. Okay. Yeah, the, right. the, the exact date's a little, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a little sketchy. Um, our first release was in 1987. Okay. Uh, yeah. And, um, and I think you, you and Tommy talked a bit about uh, we had to change the name eventually from Big Velvet Elvis to Evil Maracas. Right. There was no, you know, we, we just found out that there was another band called Velvet Elvis. And, uh, there was no uh, lawyer contact. No, or no cease pending and litigation, or no uh, <laughs> formal declaration of hostilities. Because uh, that actually works out for some bands, like Dinosaur sure. Jr. was became Dinosaur Jr. Sure. after a. Absolutely. You never heard of Dinosaur. Never heard of them. Know, no, so. I heard of Dinosaur Jr., though. Yeah. And, um, and again, we preemptively changed our name. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that band originally was me, Chris McCall. Tommy and uh, Palmer Wood. Right. Um, and Chris, I can't remember who, you know, Chris left first, and which was not a, a, a really a problem because, you know, I, Chris wanted to be a, he wanted to work in television. That was his, playing music was a hobby, something to do on the weekends, to have fun, drink beer, meet girls, blah, 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 blah. But right. what he wanted to do was work in television. Yes, go do that. I, you know, I, I'm not going to tell my friend, don't do what you want to do. Um, I actually met him at the TV production oh, did program at FCCJ. He was oh, a yeah. year ahead yeah, of me, yeah, yeah. so he was like a floor director, and I was, you know, studying the craft. Absolutely, I never went into it, but no. uh, he he had a very good career. He did really well at, at uh, you know, Channel Seven, and um, I mean, because of him doing television, I got to stand off to the side of the stage at the Jazz Festival a couple of times. Oh, right, right, yeah, because yeah, yeah. like, wow. they put that yeah, in WJCT. Sure, see some on. huge, huge names there. Uh, so and Chris left. Yeah. Do you, Do you feel like Evil Maracas was the high point for you as far as the the you know you you called it this Jacksonville kind of alt super group was that where do you felt that, like the scene had the most promise for alternative music and breaking away from the southern rock thing? Yeah, that was um, well. We had a couple of clubs. You know, there was Einstein and Go Go. Oh yeah. Um, and then Seven Thirty Club. You and I talked about that. One of the best shows I have ever seen. At this little tiny warehouse that was the rehearsal space for the Switchblades, right? Yeah, and Black Flag, and this is when they were Black Flag, and we were just huge. And um, I'll never forget they started loading. They came up and they looked at the place and were like, "Oh my god!" Because it really was just a warehouse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it was a shoebox, <laughs> and they started just loading four twelve cabinets against the back wall <laughs> behind the stage, and they, they must have put up a row of. Probably eight on either oh side. Oh my gosh! They were loud. They were the sound was clean. They were devastating. Really? I mean, and to, and to see them that close, that up, front, you know, it was like wow. And um, yeah, so I mean, seven thirty to me, seven thirty club. I saw more shows there that I really enjoyed. I mean, I saw Nirvana at you know Einstein and Go Go. Right, I yeah. saw Red Hot Chili Peppers. Yeah. Um, and that's you know that's great, but. Black flag, you know, in your face, that, you know, nah, can't right. top that. Um, and like say, you know, the switchblades were, they were always the, especially like when, you know, because I knew them when Steve Gallagher, when they started, when it was just, right. you know, Steve and Ray. And then um, I met Tommy, uh, the first, first, I believe the first gig he played with the switchblades, which was New Year's Eve, Blighted Area. Wow. Uh, 1984. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we were on the bill. We played that night, Blaine Cruz Band. And um, the difference was night and day when Tommy joined the band. Mm-hmm. He brought us this a music, mus- you know, musical musicianship, um, you know, a level of sophistication that just didn't exist in a lot of the punk bands. You know, everybody was either Steve Jones from the Sex Pistols right. or Johnny Ramone. Mm-hmm. You know, and Steve Gallagher from the Switchblades. He was more Johnny Ramone than he was Steve Jones, and Tommy was just. 
light years ahead of everybody else. And I'll never forget seeing them that first time. And I was just like, oh my God. You know, they yeah. were so, they were so good. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And Tom right. and I were instant, we're just, you know, sure. we, we've been roommates, you know, several times over the years and instant connection there. And what do you think about that small, like, uh, Jacksonville kind of has this, it's, it's a, it's the largest city by land measurement in the country or the world Correct, right, or whatever. Right. But we know all these same people. I just found out you live a block away from yep. the studio <laughs> and I passed your house every day walking yep. Iggy. And so it, it seems like there's this connection and, uh, you know, of course I interview the people I know or I've sure, met or whatever, sure. but, it, but there's this really neat cohesiveness to all these guys that have sort of overlapped this rock family tree kind of thing. Sure. I think it's it's odd because it exists sort of in a in a bubble because there's a lot of people here but there's doesn't seem to be a lot of music support. No. Do you agree with that? I, in a way what and I think you know Tommy talked about it and it was something that all of us who were doing alternative or punk had to kind of deal with was a there was a prejudice against it here, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were only two studios around here that would record Anybody, mm-hmm. uh, John Key over in uh, off McDuff, mm-hmm. out there on the west side, and Jimmy DeVito. Yep. And um, you know there was you know and we again we're talking about the southern we came you know loggerheads with the southern rock people. Right. And you couldn't play their those clubs. You couldn't play you know the clubs on the west side. No, they wanted yeah, Leonard yeah. Skinner, Molly Hatchet covers, sure. and um, and it really was it was uh, you know we were you were looked down upon. So I think what happened is. Jacksonville's alternative scene kind of coalesced around, and we all kind of, you know, knew each other. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I've lived, you know, in Portland, L.A., Atlanta. Jacksonville has a talent pool that's second to none. Some of the most talented musicians I know are here. Well, and you hear these bands yeah. getting signed out of here that you never heard of from yeah. Jacksonville. Yeah. Like, like they're, oh, we're from Jacksonville. Right. And you're like, I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know that, right. You know, um, and, and, there, and the talent pool, it, you know, musicians that, didn't make it in bands like I had Steve Shanholzer on oh, yeah, and some oh, of these yeah. other guys, just brilliant guitarists, oh, you know, sure. and just a, a creative pool of sure. people that that is is, and, and that's sort of like when I left here, I went to Tampa and it was like moving to Paris because it was like <laughs> young people would come to the shows, yes. people would actually come to shows, sure. and here it was like, you know, I mean the Beggar Weeds did good, you guys did we well, did. Yeah. but. If you weren't in one of those few bands, nobody was taking chances on And it's funny you mentioned Tampa. You know? That is where Big Velvet Elvis, Evil, that's Evil Maracas, that was kind of our place to go and, do, and you know, pack the place. Yeah. Uh, we play Ybor City all the time. Yep, and, yep. Um, uh, played, Masquerade, uh, Ritz. Yeah, uh, uh, Masquerade. Yeah, there was one of those in Atlanta. There was one down. We played Masquerade. Yep, yep. Um, you play, did you play the one in Atlanta? Yeah. So the masquerade there, I don't know if you remember, they had a um, an elevator that was like on four <laughs> wire yep. strings, uh-huh. so you'd have to load your gear and it, it would was, have to balance. It was crazy. It was crazy. Uh, Tommy, I've never and I, seen anything like that. We uh, that was like I said, that kid was like the, our third bass player in uh, Evil Maracas was a um, really good young girl named Amy Norwich. Mm-hmm. Um, who played with Walter Parks and uh, Dear Oh, Gone. yeah, okay. Yeah, I've yeah. seen her with Walter yeah. in uh, the and Fenwicks, was it? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe. And uh, so, yeah, she was with us when we played the uh, Masquerade in Atlanta. And, oh, man, you're right. It was big. It was too big for us to play at that yeah. point. Yeah, we were, we, again, we, Tommy and I kind of retooled our uh, material to fit what Amy, her style. She was really young. Mm-hmm. Um, and she, but she was a really good kind of funk slap bass player. Yeah. And so we we did. We kind of retooled our material to hmm. suit, her, suit her. But uh, so anyway, we, we digress. Uh, Big Velvet Elvis. And then, uh, which, again, you know, Chris left and then Palmer left. Um, when Chris left, we had Carlos. Came yep. to bass. I remember Carlos. Yep. And then we became a three-piece after Palmer left. And Carlos was gone around the same time. That's when Amy came in. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chris McFall came back for a little while, uh, <laughs> and then uh, Terry Douglas. When we were evil maracas at this point, and uh, to be honest, as, as objective as I can be, I think that was the best version mm. of the band, the one with the most potential mm-hmm. to make it. But um, it was, was there any interest, label interest, or anything like that? I think a little bit, but um, we imploded before. Man, you know, um, happens a lot. It does, man. It does, and that is when I met 
Phil Hilo, Mike Hogan, and joined the Filters. Right. So that would be 1989, you know, 90. Okay. Yeah. Um, so they... Um, so the filters, they uh, they had a long career. Did, yes. Was there a, a lull and then they came back again? Mm-hmm. Is that what mm-hmm. happened with them? Because I remember, again, I saw them with my sister when I was like 14 or 15, right. you know, at Latitude 30 or Manapanas or one of those places. They, they let anybody in. It didn't matter your drinking <laughs> age. They didn't care back then. And uh, so they had this resurgence with the filters. And yeah. what was that like? Was there any promise there? For well, um, of, oh, yeah. And uh, interesting, you know, I would find, I found this out kind of later on. Um Phil was looking to, he wanted something different. He wanted to do something. And Phil's the uh, principal songwriter mm-hmm. for the Filters. And um, he wanted he wanted a different sound. He wanted a different attitude. And he, he and Mike came to see me play with Tommy at um, Metropolis. Mm-hmm. And uh, I ended up talking to him, and I found out. A couple of years later, he's like, that's when Phil decided he wanted someone who played drums like me. Not not. Not necessarily me because I was in another band. Mm-hmm. Um, and how I ended up there is uh, Scott Montgomery, who was the keyboard player mm-hmm. and guitar. You, Scott, utility guy, who a lot of you know those guys are unsung, but they shouldn't be because those guys are so important to so many bands. You know, guys that can play guitar and keyboards, sing the high harmony. Yeah, you know, your Rick Danko's of the world. You know, from the band, Rick Danko was that guy that I you know you could play mandolin, bass. Mm-hmm. You just did it all. And, no, uh, I love Scott. I remember him oh, yeah. seeing him play, and he'd he'd be jumping on the tables, yeah. and playing back, and doing these solos. <laughs> he you and know, I went round and round about that one night. Oh, he didn't like yeah, the uh, he, didn't, he didn't like the showmanship. Sometimes, well, it depends. It just depends on the table um, <laughs> and whose whose lap you just fell into. He's uh, still around playing. He is. Yeah, 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 some, yeah. He's yeah, in yeah. some band. But Scott called my house and got my girlfriend Margaret and. It just so happened that that Evil Rockers had split up a couple of weeks before. Oh wow! And he called to find out if I knew any drummers, and she said, "Oh, well, by the way, he is no longer in. He's available if you want." So I auditioned. Uh, Again. Darren, Darren Ronan, yeah, Darren Ronan, yeah. It's funny they didn't remember me between auditions. I had to remind. <laughs> I had to remind them. Uh, but Darren Ronan and I met, actually. He was leaving an audition as I was coming in. Ah, so he yes. auditioned for them as well. He did, yeah. Yeah, he's been around long. Oh, Darren's, time. I love yeah. Darren, man. Great drummer. Super guy. Um, yeah. Uh, Darren's the guy that I, you know, if if the only drum lesson I've ever had was about 20 minutes talking to Darren one day. Uh-huh. Now, this was after <laughs> I had been playing for 30 years. Uh-huh. And uh, you know, the old adage, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I am the old dog that you cannot teach a new trick because yeah. I just like... I think it's a little late for me to try to learn that kind of technique. That's you know, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I love Darren. Great drummer, great musician. You know, period. And uh, so, how long did that go on with the filters? Uh, four, four, four years? years. Yeah. Um, Scott was um, like, I say, Phil always kind of had in the back of his head a different direction, and um, it just you know, with Scott, I think you know, Phil wanted to get away from that '80s kind of you know hair. Mm. Bandanas around the neck, kind of look or whatever, and wanted to. He wanted something. He wanted something that he was dabbling in alternative music at the time. Right. And um, so what happened is, you know, Scott was, you know, left the band, and um, we became a three piece. And that is when I'll be honest with you. That is when I left my internship, my apprenticeship as a drummer. Prior to that, I was I was just energy and. You know, I hit them really hard, and I had a lot of fun. And playing in a three-piece makes you aware of, you know, s- s- sonically of what is going on. Right. Um, and like, oh, wow, maybe I sh- you know, I've got two guys singing. Maybe I shouldn't play a fill while they're singing. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, you know. Yeah. And, and, and when you're a three-piece, you have a couple of options. You can go just balls to the wall volume and just obliterate. You know, there's no subtlety, just, you know, boom, power, you know, the power. Or you can incorporate dynamics and, you know, uh, harmonies. Mike and Phil, great singers. And uh, so that was our, you know, that was our calling card was great vocals, great arrangement, you know, tight pop songs with dynamics. And dynamics will go, you know, a million miles towards making you sound sure, great. absolutely. You know? yeah. Any big shows that you can recall? Oh, like we, openers? The first or? show I did with them was uh, at Metropolitan Park. 
uh, opening for a uh, Little River Band. Oh wow! America and Cool and the Gang. Wow, that doesn't yeah. seem like a good fit, really. It was it was weird, <laughs> and I always tell the story of freak. Um, oh, yacht rocky. For it you was guys. well. What happened? We all got up there, and this is like at ten in the morning. I think we went on it. I don't know, maybe one thirty, two in the afternoon, um, and we were all supposed to have a little bit of a sound check, and the drummer from the Little River Band just sat up there for like an hour. Mm-hmm. Doing beep, a beep, doing beep. a drum check, <laughs> so I am sta- so I am standing there with. And I'm, I'm going to go ahead and tell the story. I'm standing there with the drummer from America and the drummer from Little River Band. I mean, not Little River Band, uh, Cool and the Gang. And the drummer from the Cool and the Gang he goes, "Fuck this, I'm getting high." He goes, "You guys want to get high? Can I?" I'm like, "Sure." So we all we all go back. So the three <laughs> the three drummers, we all go back and we come back and. Uh, you know, everything's cool. This is my first gig with the filters. I didn't tell them until afterwards. Uh-huh. <laughs> and Phil was like, are you kidding me? I'm like, no, man. I went and got high with the guys from Cool the Gang. And, uh, and the guy from America was had this $10,000 drum kit set up on a riser behind mine. But we got done playing. He's like, dude, your kit sounds really good. Can I play your drum? I'm like, sure. Go ahead. Wow. Yeah, so instead yeah. of his... Instead of this huge kid behind that they played, mic'd up and everything. Yeah, so all that horse with no name, Adventura Highway, God, played funny, all that man. stuff on that kit, yeah. You but, still have that kit? I do not. Oh. Darren, Darren actually had it for a while. Okay. And he sold it. It was a huge, it was a kit I got from Music City. Mm-hmm. Um, I, the, my second, it was like, I had a, I bought a Tama kit after that Ludwig, used Ludwig, and then I bought this monstrosity. It was a 12-piece 1970 Ludwig kit, big, deep concert toms. Wow. They don't really make them like that anymore. And uh, the more I had to move that thing, break it down and set it up, the more I started gigging, smaller it got. Yeah. So by 1987, 88, it was a four-piece drum kit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, as as rock changed, I think a lot of people went to the smaller kits, especially with the alternative stuff, Absolutely. you know. Dave Grohl. I mean, he yeah, you know, Dave Grohl, sure. was like, yeah. Good. And he had one rack tom, but it was like, but it was huge. Eighteen. It was, yeah, it was like it was like a floor tom on top <laughs> yeah. of yeah, yeah. And again, those concert toms, we so said they just don't make those really anymore. Yeah. Where they're they're deep. And I remember the first time I played it like at the Florida Theater, and I and I got up to do, and I'm like, you know, I got up behind the kit and hit the bass drum. That like, oh, this is the room these drums are built for. Right. You know. Right. Yeah. 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 Boomy. What'd you do after the filters? Uh, Weren't filters? you up to that? Yeah, we were. Uh, we you know, we moved to Atlanta, and um, oh, with the band. You with the band, yeah, wow, we moved okay. up and, and we were with um, uh, God, what was the name of the uh, pretty big eight talent agency? Uh, Nolan Reeves, pretty big talent agency. Okay, so you had management. We did, and we worked a lot. Um, we'd go out for a few weeks, and you know, come back. Were you playing week. covers or all originals? At this um, point? We could tailor our set either way. Primarily, we were doing originals, doing a showcase gig. Good, you know, okay. not not. Good. We would come here for. We would play Cafe on the Square. We needed some money. Sure. Yeah, we'd play Cafe on the Square. Mm-hmm. We could make good money. Play three or four sets of covers. Well, a mix of originals and covers, which um, I think was always, you know, pretty cool of Cafe to let us get away with that. Yeah. Um, but the reason is because we packed them in. You know, when we played Cafe on the Square, there you know, there was a line around. You know, people lined up to come see us play, and it was always a good time. So yeah, we'd go we'd go to Huntsville, Alabama, and play you know seven people, you know in a mm-hmm. club with sawdust and peanut shells all over the floor, <laughs> and then um, come here and you know make fifteen hundred dollars a night playing at Cafe mm-hmm. on the Square. So, yeah. And was there anything after the filters or um, that- yeah filters? I came back from Atlanta and um, for the second time I moved in with Tommy, mm-hmm. and I guess Tommy and I were living together when uh, uh, Big Velvet Elvis started. You know, okay. uh, yeah, it was me and Tommy and uh, Monica, his wife, and Joey, who became my wife. You know, I just, <laughs> probably <laughs> before his actual wife banishes me to the shed out back. Uh, Joey's just one of my best friends, you know, forever. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, so I came back and um, my girlfriend and I split up. Like, if, if I, you know, if I'd known now what I, you know, knew then what I know now, I might have stayed in Atlanta. I really enjoyed living there. Uh, it was a good music scene. Um, but, yeah, so I came back here, and after uh, she and I broke up, I moved in with Tommy again. And Tommy's band was Radio Berlin, mm-hmm. and the original drummer in that band had left. Here I come. You know, now now I've, like I say, I, I have done my apprenticeship with Tommy. Now I've done my residency with Mike and Phil, and I've played hundreds of gigs. You know, we, we played a lot. And so I've, 
I've kind of graduated. Now I'm a much better drummer. So when I came and joined Radio Berlin, it was... I, I was I was at a different level playing drums at that. Point. Were you at that gig at the Copper Rocket that we talked about? Um, I don't know because uh, it was in it was in Winter Park or something, and I hadn't seen Tommy mm. in like six or seven years. And mm. we had a gig there, and he came walking in, and <laughs> I'm like, Tommy Berlin. Oh, I get it, Radio <laughs> Berlin. Radio Berlin. Yeah. And Roy was there, right. and, and I, I guess it must have been you. I was, was not. I don't think so. Ninety five ish six. Not, no, that was probably Tim Wester okay. who was still playing. Yeah, that's yeah. probably what it was. Because I came in just like say maybe a year after they had been together, mm-hmm. and I don't recall us ever getting to Orlando. Mm-hmm. Um, but I really enjoyed playing again, playing with Tommy again, mm-hmm. um, and Roy. I met Roy, and I really like Roy and Matt Morris. Uh, who I, you know, Matt and I, you know, became we very kindred spirits, and um, again, it was it was interesting because we were that band that if you came to see us, that's all you were doing that night. We were going, you know, we were we were this wall of sound, and yeah. um, you know, that's, you know, Tommy, Tommy loves to plug into a Marshall and crank it up, yeah, and I love to smack. The reason I hit my snare drum so hard is probably because I've played so many gigs where there's no mics. For the right, drums, you right, know, yeah. and I'm I'm going against two 400 watt marshals yeah, every yeah. year, and I've got a <laughs> you know four four twelve cabinet every year, and uh, like yeah, everything's so. a rim shot, pretty much. After, yeah, for the most part, yeah. and it's for consistency, for more than anything else. When I'm playing live, is um, because I mean, you know, if you start if you get at the rim shot, you, you, you could, it just cuts through everything. Right. Now, it's like a clock for the band. It is. So whatever the monitor is doing doesn't matter. I can Correct. hear that snare drum. Correct. Right. And this is where we get into my, uh, you know, the the you know the three the three legged stool of drumming, which is you know there's technique, you know rudiments and all that, which I just don't have. I never you know I didn't do marching band. Um, I always I always joke. I said I know how to do a paradiddle, and if I play one on stage, I did it by accident. I didn't do it on you know I didn't do it on purpose. Um, but I kept really good time, and I had really good feel, and um, that served me well over the years. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that kind of made up for the lack of, you know, formal training as a drummer. Mm-hmm. And, um, so anyway, yeah, Radio Berlin. And then, uh, that was, you know, then I went to film school after, you know, in Oh, early, right. Yeah, you went yeah. to Full Sail. I did. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And you studied film there. I did. And then worked as an editor. Um, really? Yeah. Out of film school for a while. Worked for Avid. Um, Worked for a really good uh, wedding video company here. You worked for Avid, the company? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. When I was out in L.A. Oh, wow. Yeah, so just, you went to L.A.? I did. I All did. right. Yeah, wow. I went to L.A. Um, and were you still playing drums, or that kind of fell by no, the wayside? No, it kind of fell by the wayside, but the guitar I had picked up. and Okay. Brings us back to the when the time that the guitar and I made up, and it's we, we got married. <laughs> um, this was when I was with, uh, really, with when I got started playing with Mike and Phil. Because I wanted to be able to communicate with them. They sp- talked about music. In a way, I had never heard guys talk mm-hmm. about, you know. Uh, well, if I sing the fifth, then you sing the, you know, and I'm like, what the fuck are they talking about? Yeah. And I'm like, oh, it all comes back. And I'm, you know, I kind of understood, you know, circle of fists and kind of stuff like that. So I started, again, you know, picking up the number one, I just wanted to be able to write songs. Um, my goals were always reasonable as far as like, I knew it at age 30, I wasn't going to be, you know, I, I don't have, I'm not, I'm not going to spend seven hours a day. Practicing scales so I can shred. Right. You know, I want to learn chords. I want to learn how to play a simple melodic lead. Um, and I was a Beatle freak, and so that was you know the Beatles are you know if you want to know how to play what did Joe Wall say, I, you know I learned how to play guitar. I started with Love Me Do and I went to the Long and Winding Road, and he goes that's how I learned how to play guitar. Mm-hmm. I'm like that makes sense because all those chords, you know the Beatles, and so I just became a chord hound and. Well, you wanted to write songs more than being a guitarist, correct? Per se, yeah. And it stuck, and I've just been. And did you join any bands as a guitarist? No, or not? I, no, no, that was never a goal to be a. I never okay. wanted to be a guitar player on stage, and not an insult to guitar, but, but guitar players are a diamond, and they're you can't swing a dead cat in this town without hitting a guitar player. A good one. A good I mean, one. There's a lot of good a lot ones. of good <laughs> guitar players, and so that was again that kind of kept me employed as a drummer because there are less good drummers. Right. You yeah, know? yeah. And um, so, but yeah, it's like I, yeah, I, I know two dozen guys, <laughs> you included, much better guitar player than I am. Well, um, I'm I'm embarrassed with some of the guys I play with. I mean, there's some really really fantastic oh, guitarists in this town. There are some great. Guitar and, but players. but for you, the guitar is just a personal thing. It is. And it is. 
And you you write songs? Do you record do. them at I all? I do, I do. Um, which brings me, <laughs> we're talking about the the things that you know that you know motivate me as a musician. Um, you know, there's four things other than the promotion and all that. You know, advertising and blah blah. That there's four things we do. We write songs. There's songwriting. There's rehearsal. Love songwriting. Love rehearsal. Recording. I'm kind of have a love hate relationship with it because you know back in the day things have changed now with digital recording. But back in the day, you go in, the onus is on the drummer. Yeah, and it's, there's basic not, tracks. Exactly, you got to get that the first you take. Get it right. Not, you can't no, punch in as a drummer. Correct. <laughs> and now we just comp everything where they just sit with the digital. Oh and, yeah. And chop. I, I saw a thing with Billie Eilish once, and she, they were talking about copying her vocals. There were 86 edits in her vocal, and yeah. I'm like, "That's crazy! You know, that's that's insane." Drummers you know, back then, it was go get it in one take. You had to do the whole damn thing in one take, and uh, for the drummers, especially. for the drummers, and the yes. vocals you could punch, but you weren't doing 80 tracks. You know, you no. didn't have you know 24 tracks. 24 if tracks. You were lucky. Jimmy DeVito, two inch yeah. tape. Yep. And um, and you know, 16 of those were drums and exactly. guitars and bass. You know, <laughs> exactly. So, you know, and so you get in, and so the onus is on. The drummer, you got to get in, and especially you know, you don't have, you know, nobody had money, you know. And, right, you had to do it two days of tracking, correct, probably to right get, to get twelve songs done. One day of mixing, yeah, if you're lucky. Exactly. I remember Tommy <laughs> and I doing the, you know, Tommy and I have had some epic arguments over the years, uh, <laughs> and I will never forget. We were doing, um, this was Radio Berlin, uh, Rubberhead Manifesto, which was our the release we had, and. <laughs> We were actually doing a cover of Won't Get Fooled Again. Wow. About a six and a half, seven minute version of the mm-hmm. song. Very up tempo, high energy. And for some odd reason, we decided to record it. And to Tommy is, I'm in the, have you ever been to DeVito's? No. Big room. He's got a big room and drums are here. And so Tommy and I are the only ones actually in the room. His amps are in this vocal booth, but he's standing in the room with me. And it's a very high energy. And I am. After like the second or third take, I'm like, okay, uh, you know, I'm getting exhausted. I'm getting tired, man. You know, and we he kept <laughs> we 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 just were not gelling that night, right? And it would be like, you know, why did you stop? And he would be like, because you stopped. And we blah 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 to the point that Jimmy labeled the entire project the Battling Bickersons. And it's, you know, he's like, I don't know, we, uh, Roy, I remember Roy and Matt just kind of looking through the the window from the control room, looking at the two of us. And we were, we were just like screaming at each other. Two strong but, personalities. It, exactly, exactly, there. exactly. But uh, yeah, so um, like I say, went to film school. And then when I came back, um, I, went, you know, I was in California, I came back here, and then... Um, a very good friend of mine, Jonathan Plant, a really good bass player, and uh, he and I met this girl named Rachel Whitford. And uh, Rachel, really kind of a unique presence, and you know, a really strong rhythm guitar player, very unique vocal style. And the three of us, we started just playing covers at uh, open mic night at the West End Cantina. Over there on uh, St. John's Avenue. You were playing drums or guitar? Playing drums. Okay. Playing drums. Yeah. And Rachel was playing guitar, just three piece. And uh, finally, you know, I, Rachel and I, I was like, why don't we try writing songs? And we did. And we started doing our own originals, and that became Rock Hell Victory, which was the name of that band. Ah, okay. Yeah. I saw something on that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, those are like, uh, you know, those are the only songs of mine that I've written that are out there. Recorded. In what there. year was, uh, was this 20, 2015? 20, so 14, not that long yeah, 13, ago. 14, 15, somewhere, yeah, yeah. And that fell apart? Or? It did. Like like bands do. What, like bands do. She yeah. moved, she is now playing with, um, I, I, I want to, The Crew Shadows? It's like a goth yeah, I wouldn't, extravaganza. I wouldn't know. I yeah. wouldn't know. <laughs> uh, well, put it this, put it this, they go over to Germany and they tour because the Germans love some golf. Oh, like it's a big they, deal. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. they do that like three weeks a year. They do that and they play all the goth, like Dragon Con. And uh, we kind of joke, the, there's a goth cruise. It's the, oh, yeah. They do every cruise it's now. It's the darkest yeah. boat afloat. <laughs> that's their, that that's really, their tagline. That is a tagline. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've had... Lots of laughs on that one, but uh, yeah, she, I mean, and I, you know, I love Rachel to death. She's really good, and um, 
But for you, you just uh, kept playing your guitar yeah. by yourself, and that's and that's where you are. And that's now. what I do now. I have you know, I just have like Garage Band and you know some MIDI stuff set up at the house. And isn't Garage Band fantastic? I love it. I mean, it's unbelievable yeah. the power you have in oh. your your Mac. Well, now. you know, I worked with you know with Avid, and so I was familiar with Pro Tools, which was right there, right? You know, really the companion piece to Avid. Same came out of George Lucas's same company, and. Um, so digital recording to me is, you know, that's awesome. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody can do it. I mean, Beck, one of my favorite artists, Beck, he recorded two complete albums on GarageBand. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's some people that have platinum records using the Apple loops. Mm-hmm. No, they didn't create their mm-hmm. own beats. And that that's a little disturbing to me. A little bit. But uh, this is the world we live in now. Sure. You know? And I do it, and it's funny. This is the only time that I do play drums now is um, I must have a, a hundred songs. Mm-hmm. Or at least parts, mm-hmm. and and I love it. I, you know, God, I can't. I, you know, I, to me, I, I, and I, you know, I told Tommy this the other day. It was like uh, my creative when I'm at my most creative is between ten o'clock at night and three in the morning, and and of course I'm not playing real drums then, but I, I'll get the headphones on. I got the guitar, and I will just. I love doing all of it. I love putting play, laying down a keyboard part, playing. You know, I got a bass. I play the bass. I do. You know, and just. And what's your stuff sound like nowadays? It's I all do, over the map. All or? over the map. Yeah. I so you got some classic rock. You got classic some rock. I get a song. Rock. I get a song called One Adam Twelve because Adam Twelve was on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, <laughs> it is just a it's a Jimmy Page meets Jimi Hendrix kind of riff. Uh-huh. Um, and then right behind it is a country song called uh, Nothing Like You. I mean, I, I I do a lot of country and kind of folky stuff. I'm a Dylan freak. Um, mm-hmm. And growing up, my parents, very cool people, considering they were born in the early 30s. Uh, my mom loved Willie Nelson, Waylon Jennings, uh, and Merle Haggard. And my dad loved Johnny Cash and Hank Williams. Wow. Yeah. So very traditional yeah. Yeah, country. Yeah. So I write a lot of country <laughs> country stuff, man, which is and, which is cool. you know. Um, I got to hear some of this stuff. Huh? You got to share it with me. Yeah, I will. I will share it with you. Most of it I keep, you know, that's just for me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but a lot of these songs, like Rachel and I had a really good, you know, again, she's really the only person I've really written songs with. Um, mm-hmm. And we had a kind of an 80 20. I did 80% of the music, maybe 20% of the lyrics, and vice versa. She did the you know, 80% of the lyrics. Mm-hmm. Good lyricist. And I'm really good at arranging things, and I hear vocal phrasing, and it's, mm-hmm. it's one of those things. And I think as a drummer, I don't know what it is. I, I always tell Phil that uh, my bass drum has a mind of its own. You know mm-hmm. what? What this thing does is you know, <laughs> and, and it, but it was years later I realized what it is is I kind of am following the vocal with my bass drum. Interesting. Yeah, that's very and I, interesting. And I feel the rests, and I feel you know like you know that, and I, I'm like oh and, you know just listening to my you know playing over the years, but um, Rachel and I had a really good way of working, you know, mm-hmm. and and the music would it would normally start with something I wrote. And um, and I think my thing is I you know I know enough about you know you know, const- you know strong song construction and arrangement that I can uh, okay you know like I you know I always joke with Phil I was like I never know what to do what would Phil do and then I go eh, fuck it I'll just go to the relative seventh or the relative minor <laughs> and uh, but but at least I know enough about that and I can yeah, and so yeah. what I typically will do will write three or four parts you know mm-hmm. this okay this is an intro. This will be the verse. This will be the chorus. This will be the bridge, and we'll you know. And then Rachel would. And I would just start working it out, and she would just start writing. And, and that that stuff is out there, right? It is, yeah. But but your stuff is not. Well, not yet. Not yet. No. Okay. No. All right. Well, my, I've got a solo album. With, you know, my friend Joey has my password in case I pass away before I okay. it goes out. And I told him. <laughs> I said, "Feel free." I said, "There's about a hundred songs on there. Do what you want to do with it. Uh, it's not like Prince." You know, uh-huh. or the what vault, it, the vault. What do you have? Like twelve hundred? <laughs> they said they could make just thirty albums out of what you know completed tracks that Prince had. Yeah, but that's a guy who just lived in the studio, loved it. And I do. I love. I love recording, and I love, you know. That's cool. What's yeah, your it, What's your gear setup like? Do you, like, uh, do you have just a single mic and? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm. I have never been like a gearhead. Um, you know, it's like, you know, all my guitar player friends, and you'll now join the ranks. And when I tell them, yeah, I just have like a line six 
thirty watt practice amp. Yeah, that's yeah. Because yeah. you know. I'm like, I'm not going. If I were going on stage, it would be something else. Well, like garage yeah. band, you go direct, and you got Correct. all every amp in Correct. the world. Exactly, you know? and that's what I end up doing. Which and they sound good. And sure. I'm an amp builder. Yes. I mean, you know, yes, so they do. I'm pretty shocked at what and that, what garage band they, again. And if and if you know enough about you know how to how to you know sound design and then you know a little bit of engineering, um, you know, you can tweak it and make it. You know, they mm-hmm. have one called God, big. Big hair something, it's on Garage Band. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. preset. Big, yeah. yeah, big, yeah. and it's you know one. If you hold the note too long, it's just going to squeal off the. Yeah, you know, it's going to peg the meter, but it's a great sound. Yeah, no, there's yeah. hundreds of yeah. them yeah. In there, yeah. and, and, so and, they're, and they're they're inspiring. You can actually get song ideas oh, yeah, from absolutely. the sounds by themselves. Absolutely, know, which I I yeah. I do a lot. And uh, my you know, and it was funny like with drums, I did become very brand centric. Um, in the years, I you know it was Ludwig drums, Zildjian mm-hmm. cymbals, DW pedals, Vic first sticks. That was it. Always, yeah. With, with guitars, I always wanted a Les Paul, so I bought a really nice Les Paul. Yeah. I always wanted a Telecaster. I had three of those. Yeah. Um, and, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and acoustics, I have a couple of. You know, I bought wow. a really kind of high end Yamaha, and a sort of, you know, middle. You know, mm-hmm. one to one to one to bang and one to you know, one to knock around and one that. And are I, you just look? At. Are you still employed? Are you? No, I retired. Retired? Yeah. yeah Most yeah. people on the show are retired, <laughs> present company included. I'm well, just, I'm doing yeah. this. I'm not really retired. Yeah. I'm just working for a lot less money. Well, exa- <laughs> well, yeah, exactly, exactly. And we talked about it. Um, you know, uh, the past, you know, the past few years were kind of strange. My dad passed away, COVID, mm-hmm. all that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah. All kind of happened at the same time, and. Um, you know, I miss my dad a lot. My, you yeah. know, my dad and I are really close, and the, you know, but it did enable me to retire. Yeah. And I was getting a, my, I have a lot of back and hip issues. So I was like, you know, I'm tired of, I, you know, I've been, you know, doing, I was doing physical work a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, well, that's, you know, that's, if you pursue music as a career, you know, it's very hard to hold down a, you know, stockbroker gig. You know, or an office, right. yeah, yeah, an office yeah, gig. Sure. If, if you know, if you really are pursuing, you know, music, yeah. mm-hmm. and I spent years, you know, trying, you're trying to make it, man, trying to, you know, go for that brass sure. ring, yeah, and that's not for everybody, no, you know, yeah. And we were talking about like the things that, you know, all of the other things that lead up, you know, the songwriting, rehearsal, uh, and the recording, to me, all lead. And it's a means to an end to performance, which is what that's what I've that's the part of playing music that. And that's my. That's the juice. That's what gets me going. I yeah. uh, love playing live, and uh, all right. Yeah. yeah. Well, Steve, I want to thank you for coming in. You're very welcome, we my we friend. could talk for days. I feel I like I could. Yes. And now I know where you live, so Iggy Come and I by. will stop by. Everybody, Absolutely. Steve Botnick <laughs> from so many different bands, Jacksonville Treasure. Okay. Thanks so much for watching the podcast, and we'll see you real soon. Joe, thank you, man. Pop Rock Shop. We make cool stuff.